Coffee is a ubiquitous drink drunk across the globe. It's the second most popular beverage behind tea and is found in many, many cultures. The largest producers at the moment are Brazil, Vietnam and Colombia, and the culture perhaps most associated with drinking coffee is the United States of America. The reason why it became so popular in the America uh, was because after the War of Independence from the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom traders who controlled the tea market at the time refused to trade with the Americans, and so coffee uh, rose in ascendancy and became a drink that's very much associated with our culture. Decaffeinated coffee in particular is a growing market. It currently represents 12% of the world economy, coffee economy, uh, which is worth roughly 1.5 billion US dollars a year. So it's a huge market, and decaffeinated coffee has been around now for over 100 years. However, the methods in which it's been decaffeinated have changed and become a lot safer uh, and a lot better. So I want to just talk a little bit about decaf coffee, how it's made, uh, and what the future of it is. Now, coffee was first drunk, so we think, uh, about 800 AD, by Ethiopian herdsmen, goat herdsmen. And what they noticed, curiously enough, was that the goats that they were looking after seemed to dance or certainly behave much more animatedly after they'd been eating certain beans. And these were coffee beans. And so they tried the coffee beans, um, and that's how people began drinking coffee. Now, uh, the years, many years have passed, um, and the idea of decaffeinated coffee came along. It was actually discovered by accident when a shipment from Nicaragua to Germany got completely soaked, completely soaked all the way over. And what happened was the caffeine, as well as most of the flavourings, diffused out of the coffee beans into the water. And so the residual coffee beans, when you made coffee with them, didn't have that effect of having the caffeine. The caffeine is that which gives you uh, the ability to stay awake. It seems to heighten your energy and prevent people sleeping. It can lead to insomnia. So that was the first thing uh, that people discovered. Now, the first patented procedure for making decaffeinated coffee it was by a German. It's actually by a man called Ludwig Rosalius, and he patented that in 1906. And the way that he did that was by steaming the coffee beans in brine and by using a chemical called benzene, uh, and that they used this as a solvent to remove the caffeine. The problem with this method is that benzene is, is a very toxic chemical. It's found in things such as napalm, uh, and this produces many, many health problems. And so whilst you do make decaffeinated coffee, uh, it wasn't particularly safe. Now when I say decaffeinated coffee, what is it exactly that we mean by that? Because there's a different standards. Now truly it should mean 100% free of caffeine, but in reality, that's not what it means at all. See, the problem is the coffee beans come with caffeine in them. It's not something you add to it. And decaffeinated coffee is more expensive than coffee because you have to have additional procedures to take the caffeine out of it. Now, the United States and the international standards for decaffeinated coffee is that the coffee should be 97% caffeine-free. Now, this is different in the European Union, where the standard is 99.9% caffeine-free. And so whilst you have less caffeine in your drink, it will be more expensive because the procedures needed to take that amount of caffeine out um, become much more expensive. So as you approach the, the smallest fractions of caffeine in the beans, it becomes proportionally more expensive to take the caffeine out. So... What is the problem about just using water to get rid of the, the caffeine if we can't use benzene because it's carcinogenic, cancer-causing? Well, the problem is, is that other flavours and the things that give coffee that nice taste will also diffuse out of the bean from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And that means that your coffee, whilst not decaffeinated, will not taste very nice. Nobody will buy it um, and nobody will drink it. So the systems developed in the 70s, 1970s and 80s. The system worked by using uh, steaming the beans for 30 minutes at a time and then rinsing them with something called ethyl acetate. And this was derived originally from fruit and vegetables. This is uh, called, or they called it, a naturally decaffeinated process because of the fact that the ethyl acetate came from fruit and vegetables. Now, I don't know whether you can really argue the toss as to whether there is such a thing as naturally decaffeinated, because everything is made up of chemicals. It just so happens that these chemicals came from fruit and vegetables. However, whilst they are found in fruit and vegetables, on an industrial scale, what the uh, manufacturers found is that they couldn't harvest sufficient quantities of this ethyl acetate from fruit and vegetables, so they ended up using synthetically made ethyl acetate anyway. So it probably didn't hold up to its claim of naturally decaffeinated at all. There's a problem with this method as well, and that's that this ethyl acetate in high quantities has also been found to be potentially a carcinogen, which means it potentially might cause some health difficulties and promote cancers. Uh, and so this is a method that's not particularly favoured either at the moment. Charcoal filters are one good way of getting rid of caffeine from beans. 
And th this is where you, you coat a filter and using a carbohydrate solution such as sucrose. And the caffeine will stick to this and you can use it to pass the water through that your beans have been um, leached out of the caffeine and the coffee flavour in. And this is a good way of removing the caffeine. The problem is how do you get rid of the caffeine but not, the, not all the flavourings? A, a method that's been used uh, an awful lot actually recently is that called the Swiss water process, developed in Switzerland surprisingly enough. And this is where you take your raw beans and you place them into hot water uh, and then all the caffeine and flavourings leach out into the water. You then throw those beans away, you pass the water over a charcoal filter where the caffeine gets stuck to it and the rest of the flavoured water passes through. Then what you do is you take some new beans, some new green unroasted beans, you put it in that water and then as things diffuse from areas of high concentration to low concentration, the caffeine passes out of the beans into the water but because of all the flavourings from the old beans that were in the water, very little of the flavour actually transfers. And so that way, you can keep the flavour, uh, but the caffeine goes. And then you only lose a certain percentage of caffeine that way, so what you do is you repeat that process a number of times, perhaps up to 12. 8 to 12 times is not uncommon. Uh, and that's one more good way of producing decaffeinated coffee. However, um, there are more modern processes that are used nowadays, and they use the supercritical fluids. Or supercritical gases. They use supercritical carbon dioxide primarily, although oxygen is also used. And what this means is that you are dealing with a carbon dioxide gas that's highly pressurized, perhaps up to 300 atmospheres, 200 to 300 atmospheres. And this means that it's got some properties of a gas, particularly the diffusion properties, where things will diffuse very, very easily. But because of its density, it behaves somewhat like a liquid. Uh, and this can be useful for when we're trying to transfer things between, between solutions and between stations and between beans. So this supercritical carbon dioxide can be used in the same process as we used in the Swiss water process to leach the caffeine out into it. The problem with this is that it's very expensive and it requires a lot of expensive equipment and a lot of expensive treatment plants and so only large manufacturers have been able to utilize this process. If you want to make decaffeinated uh, coffee or decaffeinated tea for that matter yourself from caffeinated product and um, there is one quick method that you can do which will leach out some, if not all, of the caffeine. If you have your tea or coffee in a bag form, if you place it in a, a cup of boiling hot water for perhaps one minute, take it straight out, throw that water away, and put it in with a new cup of coffee, um, a new, new cup of hot water, then you'll have uh, coffee which is mostly decaffeinated, or tea which is mostly decaffeinated. And this is because the caffeine actually dissolves out faster than the flavourings. And so you have a quick way and a cheap way of reducing the caffeine contents in your drinks, even though it won't completely remove it. So caffeine in itself, it's a chemical which promotes, um, it's a stimulant, and it's promoted uh, with negative side effects for health, generally, and this is to do with insomnia in particular. If you have coffee or a large amount of caffeine in the evenings, people find it difficult to sleep. There has been some recent research, however, showing some potential positive benefits of caffeine. Uh, there's been some links to show a reduced risk of Parkinson's disease and a reduced ability to feel muscle fatigue when you're doing exercise, so it's possible to exercise for longer. Caffeine can increase heart rate, um, it can cause heartburn, and it can also have been shown to increase anxiety. And heavy, uh, heavy consumption isn't recommended by health authorities for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding because of the potential health risks to unborn children. Now, in terms of decaffeinated coffee that's found across the world, you find different amounts of caffeine in it. And so a recent study uh, in the New York Times showed that the decaffeinated coffee with the least amount of coffee is that that's actually found in McDonald's restaurants throughout the world. It has a very, very low amount of caffeine in their decaf. Conversely, a study in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology found 21 milligrams of coffee in a large Starbucks coffee, which is actually a relatively high amount given that an average cup of freshly brewed coffee that's meant to be caffeinated can contain between 85 and 100 milligrams of coffee. So decaffeinated coffee does vary in terms of its strength and it does vary in terms of the process that's used to get the caffeine out. Now in terms of the future, the future of decaffeinated coffee might lie in genetic modification. Genetically modified foods are prevalent in many sectors of the things that we eat. Uh, one quick example is that of seedless grapes. Uh, you can genetically modify grapes so that they don't produce seeds, and these um, people prefer to eat because they don't have to spit out the seeds. 
So it is possible to genetically modify coffee. Some researchers in the University of Campinas uh, have showed that in Ethiopia, they've managed to produce coffee beans that have virtually no caffeine. And that study was produced in 2004. There's one problem with this, however, and that's that the resulting coffee doesn't taste very well. Um, some of the genetic changes they've had to introduce to breed out the caffeine uh, has also lost some of the flavorings of coffee. So research is ongoing to develop a coffee which will be naturally decaffeinated or certainly naturally very low in caffeine. And this will allow third world countries and other economies to be able to compete with the large conglomerates that have very expensive plants. It will also reduce the price of decaffeinated coffee, making it more affordable worldwide. So this is potentially the future of decaffeinated coffee. And my question for you is this. What are the advantages and the disadvantages of using genetic modification, genetic engineering, to produce coffee that is decaffeinated? Uh, see if you can weigh them up and decide what you think, whether this is an appropriate way forward or whether we should stay, stick with diffusion techniques to remove caffeine from it. Thank you.